Today, I'll take a look at and compare a few common motion and distance sensors. For each, I'll talk about the published specs, pinouts, and wiring diagrams, and show how each can be implemented using ESP Home. I might also generate a little magic smoke along the way. And towards the end, I'll also cover a few situations where using a distance sensor for motion detection might yield better results for your project. Hi, and welcome to Resin Chem Tech. Today I'm going to be talking about some common motion and distance sensors you can add to your DIY projects. And while I'm going to be using ESP boards and showing examples in ESP Home, these same concepts can be applied to other systems and other boards like Arduinos or Raspberry Pis using Python or even C++. As always, be sure to check the video description for any parts that I show and links to additional information. I'll show the specifications for each sensor, but there are a few important parameters to keep in mind for your particular project. And the first one of those is range. Now, most motion detectors won't have a minimum range, but distance sensors generally have a maximum and a minimum range. Next is the field of view. This is how broad of an area that the sensor can detect, both left and right and up and down. Now this only applies to motion sensors, but there's a cooldown trigger time, and this applies pretty much to any type of motion sensor. When it first detects motion, after that motion is gone, the motion detector will continue to show motion for a certain amount of time. This is called the cooldown or the trigger time before it clears, and this can be anywhere from 2 to 3 seconds to well over 30 seconds or more. A few other important things to keep in mind is the power requirements. Will the sensor work off of 3.3 or 5 volts? What kind of power usage does the sensor actually draw? What kind of communication or signal type does it use? Is that I squared C? Is it UART? This is going to determine the number and types of GPIO pins we need on an ESP board and can also determine how many of a particular type of a device we can connect to a single ESP board. What is the signal voltage? Remember that our ESP boards can only accept 3.3 volts on its GPIO pins. What are the environmental conditions for your project? Some sensors are going to work better in certain environments over others. And finally, what is the cost versus the true need for your particular project? Let's start out by talking about motion detectors. Now, there are a lot of standalone, complete motion detectors that you can buy out there on the market. You can get them with Zigbee or Z-Wave or even Wi-Fi or the new presence detectors that allow you to detect motion in multiple zones by multiple objects at the same time. We're not going to be talking about any of those. We're going to be talking about components that you can add to your own DIY project. Of course, you could just use a standalone motion detector and use something like Home Assistant to have motion trigger something like a light. But what happens if Home Assistant is down or even if your Wi-Fi is down? By adding a motion detector to our own project, we can control everything locally that will continue to work without any outside system. While there are many types of different motion detectors, I'm going to cover a couple of the most common today, and that is the PIR, or Passive Infrared, and a Microwave Radar. Let's start with the one you're probably more familiar with if you've got any kind of motion-based devices in your house, and that's the PIR sensor. Even within PIR detectors, there are different sensors that are used. In my case, I'm looking at the AM312, so let's quickly take a look at a few of the specifications we talked about before. This particular motion detector has a range of around 3 to 5 meters and a field of view of around 100 degrees. Now it takes about 4 or 5 seconds for a full reset to go from motion to being ready to detect motion a second time. It operates anywhere from 2.7 to 12 volts, so we can use our 3.3 volt or our 5 volt pin off of our ESP board to power it. It does have a single data out pin, which acts as a binary sensor. It's high when motion is detected and low when it's not. So therefore, we only need one digital GPIO pin on our board. And they cost anywhere around 50 cents to $2, depending on where you buy them and in what quantity. When it comes to the actual pinouts, it's important to remember that even though these are both AM312 PIR motion detectors, they were purchased from different sources. And they aren't always exactly the same, and that includes the pinouts. Take a look here at the one on the left. It actually has markings on the board itself. It marks that this far left pin is our positive voltage, the far right is our ground, and the center pin is our data line. However, this one over here on the right does not have any markings on the board to indicate polarity or which pin is which. There are also no markings on the back side of the board as well. You can't assume that this one is the exact same pin out as this one. You always need to check. 
And let me show you what happens if you get that polarity wrong. So I've hooked up the power connections to both these sensors. This is the one that was originally on the left and it has the markings. This one doesn't have any markings. So just for fun, I've put the positive over here on the right and the ground on the left. So let's go ahead and hook up five volts power just to see what happens. Yeah, I don't know whether you can see it, but we've got magic smoke. So there it goes. And plug that back again. So I've now immediately fried this PRR sensor. That's why it's always ooh, kind of smelly. That's why it's always important to make sure that you check the diagram that comes with the one that you buy. I've actually had these with these polarity actually reversed like I'm showing here. As a general rule, the positive connection on these will always be next or on the same side as the voltage regulator. But again, check the documentation to be absolutely sure. Once you've identified the proper pinout, then the connection to the ESP is extremely easy. We just connect our positive to either our 5 volts or our 3.3 volts, ground to ground, and our data pin can connect to any appropriate digital GPIO pin. This does draw very low current, so there's no problem with connecting this directly to the ESP board and powering the ESP board via the USB port. Of course, you can always power it by an external 5 volt power supply as well. Adding the PIR sensor to ESP Home is just as easy as it is wiring it up. We simply add a binary sensor, give it a platform at GPIO, indicate which pin we're using for our data signal from the sensor. In this case, I'm using D1, or I could just use a 5 since it's GPIO 5. I give it a name that's going to appear in Home Assistant, and optionally, I give it a device class, in this case, Motion. That way, it will show up with the right icon and show detected or not detected on my dashboards instead of just showing off or on. And I'm giving it an ID here, and I'm giving it an ID because now I'm going to add an automation for this. So now let's say I connect up a relay to my same ESP board. I define that in the ESP Home as an output, again using GPIO. In this case, I'm going to hook my relay up to pin D5. Now I can come back up to my PIR sensor, and I can add an automation so that this PIR sensor in the motion controls that relay. I simply say anytime the state changes, if the binary sensor is detecting motion, then turn on the relay, otherwise turn the relay back off. So in this case, everything is going to run locally on this ESP32 or the ESP8266. Once it's installed and powered on, it doesn't need Home Assistant to be able to control, say something like a light based on motion. Okay, let's move on and take a look at the other type of motion detector I'm going to review today. And this is the RCWL0516 microwave radar detector. It actually uses Doppler radar to detect motion. So again, let's take a quick look at some key specs. The range on this is actually quite a bit longer than the PIR sensor from five to seven meters. Note that this is adjustable. It has a field of view of a full 360 degrees. That means it can detect motion in any direction in front of, behind, above, or below the sensor. It has a cooldown time of two to three seconds. Once again, this is adjustable. Operating voltage is four to 28 volts. That means we're gonna to need to use the five volt pin on our ESP board. The 3.3 pin won't work for this particular sensor, but like the PIR sensor, it has a single data output pin, which is binary, high for motion, low for clear. So we only need one digital GPIO pin on our ESP board, and they cost anywhere around one to $5, again, depending on source and quantity. So let's take a look at the pinout of this, and you might be surprised that this is gonna be connected to the ESP32 or the ESP8266, just like the PIR sensor we just looked at. We have VN, but in this case, this does have to be five volts. It won't run off a 3.3 ground, and our data are our line out. Just like the PIR sensor, this is a binary digital line out. It will be high when motion is detected and low when it's clear. So this goes back and connects to a single digital GPIO pin on our ESP board. But you might be wondering about a couple of these other pins and these pads on this board. This is where we get some extra flexibility using this over a PIR sensor. First, there's a CDS pin and a CDS pad. That is where we can actually hook up a photoresistor or a light dependent resistor to either to ground in this pin or across these two pads so that this will only trigger when the light is below a certain level. And we can alter that light level by adding just another standard resistor to this as well. And you'll also notice a 3V3 or a 3.3 volt pin here. Don't think that you can power this by 3.3 volts. This is 3.3 volts out 
and it can be used to power another device. Now it is only 100 milliamps, but you could easily power something like a temperature sensor or even an LED or two off of this pin. When I showed the specs, I mentioned the fact that both the cooldown time and the range of this can actually be modified. And that's what these other pads are for. This first one, which is labeled R-GN, is for resistor in the gain. So we can apply a resistor across this and actually lower or shorten the range detection of this. In a similar manner, you can also adjust the cooldown or the reset time. And that's over here labeled C for capacitor and TM for time. So we can actually apply a capacitor across here and lengthen the default two second reset time. So you may have particular needs, especially if you're doing something like controlling a light and you want it to remain on, say for a certain amount of time, even after motion's detected, well, you can change the cooldown or the reset time on this by applying a capacitor. Not only is the RCWL0516 sensor wired to the ESP in exactly the same way as a PIR sensor, it's treated exactly the same way in ESP Home. You define it as a binary sensor, tell it what GPIO pin you're using, and give it a name. So let's take a look at both of these sensors and talk a little bit about the pros and cons of each. We can see here the RCWL512 does have a longer range and a full 360 degree field of view. It also has a quicker cooldown, but remember both of those can be adjusted. Costs just slightly more than the PIR sensor, but note the PIR sensor uses passive infrared. That means it's only going to detect heat signatures. So it's not going to detect things like a moving tree branch. Now that can be a problem if you're going to install this in a warm area or non-climate controlled area. As the ambient temperature gets closer and closer to body temperature, it's going to have a more difficult time actually detecting that motion. On the flip side, the microwave radar detector will detect any kind of movement. And so it will detect something like a tree branch moving. Now that could be a problem or an issue because you could have this installed in your house. And since it has 360 degree view and will penetrate walls, an outside tree branch could actually trigger the motion on this microwave radar detector. That means this is probably not the best choice for something like primary control of a light. Someone could simply walk by the wall in an opposite room and trigger motion and turn on the light. So it depends on your particular use case as to which one might make better sense for you. If you're interested in how the microwave detector compares to the PIR sensor, I did another video of an upgraded multi-sensor. In that video, I tested the range of the RCWL0516, including when it was inside an enclosure, and I also tested its ability to detect motion through walls. You can find a link to that video down in the video description. So let's move on and talk about a few different types of distance sensors. And again, I'm going to start with what's probably the most common distance sensor used, and that is an ultrasonic sensor. This is the HCSR04 ultrasonic sensor. It works by sending out an ultrasonic sound wave pulse out of a transmitter, and then measures the amount of time it takes for that signal to bounce off of an object and come back to the receiver. The HCSR04 has a minimum distance of around two centimeters or just about an inch, and a maximum distance of about 13 feet or 400 centimeters. It has a field of view of about 15 degrees. It does operate off of five volts, so we can't use 3.3 volts to power this. It uses two GPIO pins in terms of a pulse to send out the signal and an echo to receive the signal back. So we just need two digital GPIO pins on our ESP board. The cost of this is anywhere around $1.50 to $3, again, depending on source and quantity. The pinout and the wiring, for this is really pretty simple. We have our VCC, which is our five volt connection on one side, our ground connection on the other. In the middle are our two pins to send out the trigger and to receive the echo. And again, these can be connected to any appropriate digital GPIO pin on your ESP board. Using an ultrasonic sensor in ESP Home is very easy since ESP Home already has a platform for that. We just need to define a sensor, use a platform of ultrasonic, tell it which pins we're using for our trigger and our echo. And again, I'm using D1 and D2, but you can also just use the GPIO numbers of five and four and give it a name. Now there are a number of other options that you can include with your sensor. And since I'm in the US and we all know that Americans don't deal very well with the metric system, I'm taking the value that's returned from this sensor, which is in meters, and I'm simply converting that over to feet by multiplying by 3.281. Next is the VL53LOX time of flight sensor. 
Now this is similar to the ultrasonic sensor, but instead of using sound, this is using light to send out a pulse of light and measuring the amount of time that light takes to come back to the sensor. It has a minimum distance of down to around five centimeters and a maximum distance of around 120 centimeters. It has a 25 degree field of view. It will operate anywhere off of 2.6 to 5.5 volts. But do note, I'm gonna jump down here to the signal voltage. The voltage that it puts out is the same as the voltage you put in. Since we want 3.3 volts coming out to our GPIO pins, I'm going to power this by 3.3 volts. It is an I squared C device, which means again, we need two data pins for data and clock to our ESP board. The pinout and wiring is pretty straightforward on this. We have our voltage in and our ground. Now in the case of an ESP board, we do want to use 3.3 volts for our voltage in because that's the same voltage we're going to get back out. And then being an I squared C device, we have two pins that we need, a data and a clock. And by default, on the ESP8266 boards, the clock line is D1 or GPIO5, and the data line is D2 or GPIO4. Now, there are a couple of other pins here. You're probably not going to use these in most cases, but GPIO1 here can be used as a output interrupt to let you know when data is ready. And this last one, this X shut, is normally pulled high by default, but you can pull that low or pull it to ground to actually shut the sensor off. Now this comes with pin headers, but they're generally not attached. So you will have to do a little bit of soldering. And one other little tip, these generally come with a small protective film over the top of the IC sensor. So if you're getting really strange results, make sure you've gone back and you've removed that small little protective cover off of the sensor. Like the ultrasonic sensor, ESP Home luckily has a platform for the VL53LOX. Since this is an I2C device, we do need to include that integration in our ESP Home code. But after that, we just use the platform of VL53LOX and give it a name. That's all that's required. Now, there are a few optional items. In fact, there are a number of optional items, but one to note here is the update interval. By default, if you don't include this, it only updates once every 60 seconds. If you want a faster update time, you need to make sure you include an update interval in there. And in my case, once again, this is returning a value in meters, so I'm converting that over to feet. The final distance sensor I'm going to take a look at today is the TF Mini S LiDAR distance sensor. Now, it's similar to the other two in the fact that it's going to send out a pulse, but instead of sending out a single pulse, this is going to send out multiple pulses of light to more or less create a mesh of the object it's trying to measure. That's going to result in giving you much more accuracy and a much more stable signal than the other two sensor types. Do note that Ben Awake makes a number of different TF Mini models. I'm looking at the TF Mini S today. So just be aware that other TF Mini models may have some different specs than what I'm showing. And this does have the highest minimum distance of the sensors I've looked at, but it also has the longest maximum distance or range of any of the other sensors, all the way out to about six meters or just under 20 feet. And it can be programmatically changed to long range mode where it can measure and detect distances all the way out to 12 meters or around 39 feet. Although you do pay a little bit in terms of resolution and accuracy in that long range mode. It has the narrowest field of view of any of the sensors of only two degrees. Now this can be an advantage or disadvantage depending on your particular use case. It does require five volts and it uses UART or the serial bus for communications by default, which means we need to use an RX and TX pin on our ESP board. Do note that this can also be programmatically changed to use I squared C. I've not tried that before I've read. It does come at the cost of some accuracy and stability of the signal. One other thing to note here is that cost. This is anywhere from 10 to 20 times more expensive than the other distance sensors that I'm looking at. But what you're paying for here is you're paying both for that long range and accuracy and stability of that signal. For the pinout and wiring, note that the TF Mini comes with a small JST style connector. Fortunately, they do include a couple of cables along with the device. One of them has simple DuPont jumpers on the end, so you can use this on something like a breadboard without doing any soldering. It also comes with a JST to JST connector, so you can add a JST connector onto your PCB or your prototype board, but do note that the pinout on one end does not match the pinout on the other. Only one of these two actually fits into the TF Mini and it will keep the pin orientation correct. But looking at the actual pinout from left to right, we have ground, then five volts, then RX, 
and TX for receive and transmit. Now do note when dealing with the serial device, you need to flop, flip flop the RX and the TX when connecting to your ESP board. So the RX on the device connects to TX on the ESP and TX connects to RX. It's actually one of the most common mistakes I see people make when dealing with serial devices is they forget to flip flop the TX and the RX between the device and the ESP board. Now, unfortunately, at least at the time of this recording, there isn't an integration or a platform for the TF Mini in ESP Home. That means if you want to use an ESP Home, it's going to require creation of an external component. And to do that, you either have to write or import custom Arduino library into your ESP Home node. Now, do note that there are some Arduino libraries out there. This particular one is for the TF Mini Plus. I don't know if it would work with the TF Mini S or not. But just know that there isn't a native way to use this in ESP Home at the time. So you're probably looking at doing something like writing Arduino code and using MQTT to import that into Home Assistant. So now let's take a look at our three different distance sensors side by side. Again, you can see the range and field of view of each of these. You know, looking at the ultrasonic versus the TF Mini, they have about the same range. So why in the heck would you pay that much more money for something like the TF Mini over the ultrasonic? Well, there's one other thing that really isn't reflected here in the specs, and that has to do with both the accuracy and the noisiness or stability of the signal. In my video where I created an ESP-based parking assistant, I actually took all three of these sensors and tested them side by side. In those tests, I was looking not only for accuracy and range, but the stability of the signal at different distances all the way out to the maximum range of the sensor. And by far, the TF Mini was both the most accurate and the most stable of all three sensors. You can check out that video if you want to see the full test and results but it's going to depend on your particular needs. If you don't need that high accuracy and high stability of the signal, then there's no reason to pay that additional money and something like an ultrasonic or time of flight sensor might be just fine. There's one more subject I would like to cover, and that's a situation where you might have better results using a distance sensor for a motion detector as opposed to using an actual motion sensor itself. Let's take a situation where you might have a room or a large space, but you only want to detect motion within a small part of that. Now, of course, you could spend a lot of money for one of these fancy presence detectors that have multiple zones and to try to create a zone for just that space. But we want to try to do this with these cheap little components that we just took a look at. Well, the problem is if you use a PIR motion sensor, for one thing, it generally has a very broad or wide field of view. Yeah, you can try to restrict that with fins or tubes or even paint on part of the sensor. And even if you can narrow down the size, it doesn't help with the range that's going to extend past that. So anything inside of that green is going to be detected as motion. But if we take that motion sensor and we replace it with something like a distance sensor, well, first off, the field of view of distance sensors tends to be quite a bit narrower. And then we can actually use the measured distance as a minimum and a maximum to kind of zero in on that exact area that we want to detect for motion. And using ESP Home, we can take that and turn it into a binary sensor so it functions just like a normal motion detector in Home Assistant. Let me show you a couple of examples of how I do that in my home. In my garage, I'm actually using two ultrasonic distance sensors to act like presence detectors for my vehicles. Now, all I really want is a true false value. The car is there or it's not there, much like you would get with a motion detector. But you can't use a motion detector in this case because once motion stops, a motion detector is going to reset to clear. And it's going to do that whether the car is there or not there. But by using distance, I can use ESP Home to convert that over to a binary sensor. And the distance doesn't even need to be real accurate in this case. It just needs to be within a range. So it makes an ultrasonic sensor a good choice. So over in ESP Home, I've defined my ultrasonic sensor exactly like I did before. Now in this case, I'm not adding a unit of measure because I really don't care about the measured distance. We're just going to use that measured distance to update a virtual binary sensor. So the first thing I have to do is I need to add that binary sensor. So I'm just going to add that. It's not going to be tied to any GPIO pins or any physical sensor. So I'm using a platform of template. I am giving it an ID here of car presence because we're going to need that ID here in a minute to update the ultrasonic sensor and I'm giving it a device class of presence. That way it will report home or away. Now I just need to add a little bit of logic to this ultrasonic sensor that's going to use the distance to update that binary sensor. Now this might look a little bit overwhelming. It's really just a little bit of Arduino code put in to the sensor as a lambda. And it's really pretty straightforward. 
Now, in my case, I'm going to define a minimum and maximum distance. I have to do this in meters because that is how the ultrasonic sensor returns its values. But in my case, my ceiling in the garage is about nine and a half foot tall. My cars stand about five foot tall. So that means a measured distance of about four and a half feet when the car is present. I'm using a little bit of a range here because the ultrasonic sensor can tend to bounce a little bit. In addition, when the car is not there, since I'm taller than five and a half feet, I can actually go stand underneath the sensor and it won't trigger that the car is present. It's only going to show the car is being present when it falls between about four and five feet. So all I have to do then is take a look at the measured distance and I come down here and I say if that binary sense, if it is within that range and the binary sensor is already true, there's no need to update it again. But if it's not, then I need to go ahead and update that binary sensor with a value of true. Conversely, if the measured distance is outside of that range, if the binary sensor is already false, I don't have to update it. Otherwise, I publish a state of false to that binary sensor. And what that does is in my Home Assistant dashboards, it now gives me a nice binary presence detection for both of my vehicles, similar to what I would get using something like a binary motion detector. In my other use case, I actually made a video out of the situation where I took a PIR motion detector and replaced it with the VL53LOX time of flight sensor to create better binary triggers for controlling my LED stair lighting. Now the issue with the original PIR sensor is just like the example I showed. Not only did it have a wide field of view, but it also had a long range. So I could try to use fins or tubes to block out some of that. But the problem is even when I walked by this area or right here next to the stairs, it could still trigger the lights. So by using the VL53LOX time of flight sensor, the first thing I did was narrow down that field of view to make it much smaller. Then I am also able to use the distance to create a trigger value for setting the binary sensor to true or false, more or less creating a break beam across that step so the lights only triggered when you stepped on that step within 30 inches of the sensor. The ESP home code here is very similar to what I showed before. Once again, we're going to start out with just the standard definition for our time of flight sensor, which is just like before. The only thing that's different here is I did set a very short update interval. So every tenth of a second, it's going to take a reading. But I've also set this to internal true. I don't really care about that distance. So there's no reason to spam the Home Assistant logs with all the measurement values. And this way, I don't have to omit it from my recorder. I'll just set that to true with a very quick update interval. But once again, we need to add that virtual binary sensor. So we'll stick that in there. Again, I've given it a name and an ID. This time I'm giving it a device class of motion. So in Home Assistant, it's going to look exactly like a motion detector. I just come down here and add really the same type of logic. The only difference is here, I don't have a min and a max. I just have a trip distance. So anything shorter than this distance is going to cause the motion detector or the binary sensor to be updated to true. If it's not already true, any distance greater than that is going to set that motion detector or binary sensor to false. So that's just a couple of examples of how you can use a distance sensor and treat it like it's a motion detector. Well, that certainly doesn't cover every type of motion or distance sensor out there, or does it even cover all the pros and cons or particular use cases for the sensors that I did show? But hopefully it gives you some idea of how you might integrate motion, distance, or both into your next DIY project. Until next time, I'd like to say thank you for watching, and I hope to see you soon.